So, uh, so this talk uh, is called "Why Does Tibetan Stack Its Letters?" Uh, and if uh, I think most of you know some Tibetan, so uh, we'll be familiar with this. Uh, I'll have some preliminaries, uh, then the Tibetan script, then look at uh, prescripts, then superscripts. Oops, some of it is still in German. Uh, then some intermediate conclusions. Uh, then look at classical Tibetan. So most of it's about old Tibetan. Uh, and then uh, we'll end. Okay, so here's a, a Tibetan syllable. Uh, this is drup, which means accomplished, and, and I tried very hard to write it in a way that it might make sense even if you don't know Tibetan, although I think most people here probably do. Um, so you see that the S goes on the top, so basic, basically, or no, let me, let's start the vowel. Yeah, you have consonants that come after the vowel or on the right, the vowel and con most consonants that come before the vowel are in the middle, uh, but then for some reason this B is on the left. And uh, as a convention, uh, in order to sort of make it legible throughout, I put the, uh, the prescript in blue and the superscript in orange. So, uh, so now we're going to look at the behavior of the prescripts in Old Tibetan compounds, the behavior of superscripts in Old Tibetan compounds, and then the pattern in classical Tibetan. Okay, so let's look at um, uh, the prescript, uh, and I'm going to look at three morphemes. So, you know, let's say words, uh, how they behave in compound. They are pun, which means um, official, uh, tsun, which means uh, queen, and zik, which means leopard or sea. Uh, so, uh, when you have a word initial. Uh, before a vowel, sorry, word initial or before a vowel, then you keep the prescript. So here we have tree dpun, where dpun means uh, official and tree means uh, 10,000. So it means miriarch, and you keep the d because it's after a vowel. Whereas uh, when you have chiliarch, so after, after, um, after a thousand, uh, so 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 official who runs a thousand unit in the army, tong pun, then you delete the d because it's after a consonant, and we can ha see both forms of the morpheme in a single sentence. Here uh, you have chuk sam tong pun pun yoki mun lam du solwa. So prayers uh, for the benefit of superiors and subordinates on behalf of the chiliarch. Uh, Chuktsam, where you see you have uh, the word uh, punyok, which means the officials and subordinates. At the beginning of a word, it, you keep the D, uh, but inside a word after a consonant, you, you lose the D. Okay, now looking at queen, uh, word initial and after a vowel, you, you keep the B, but a uh, word internal after a consonant, you lose the B. I gave this talk in Germany. I, I thought I had I had cleaned it all up and, and turned it into English, but uh, it would appear not entirely successfully. <laughs> so I did in a bit of a hurry, I guess. So sorry about that. <laughs> Anyhow, now I'm looking at uh, Zik, Leopard, or uh, C. Uh, so here we just have two names. Snya uh, Gziks, where the you keep the G after a vowel word internally. But you delete the G uh, word internally after a consonant. Yeah, so you you get the idea, I think. So looking at these uh, morphemes all together through throughout, let's say the documents in the Old Tibetan documents online and a couple more, uh, y you get uh, sort of this pattern of keep the prescript after vowels and word initial, delete the prescript after consonants word internal. Uh, I I list here the regular and the exceptional uh, examples, and and you see that there there are exceptions. Yeah, that needs to be uh, looked at a little bit more, but um, the evidence is quite strong for this pattern. So now that was it for the prescript. Now let's look at uh, superscripts, and this I'll do primarily with. Uh, with one uh, morpheme as my example, which is a bratsen, or you know, uh, sorry, I, this, that's I should have said bratsan if I'm saying it in Old Tibetan, and tsen if I'm saying it in Modern Tibetan. You know, in Modern Tibetan, you don't pronounce any of these things anyhow. So, um, 
So uh, our custom of pronouncing things in, in uh, modern Tibetan is not necessarily helpful for giving this presentation. But anyhow, uh, here you see the word mighty. It also you know, occurs in the word emperor and other things, uh, where we have the B prescript and the R superscript. Now, if you just look at the forms that occur in texts, uh, Old Tibetan texts naturally sort of cleave into two groups. One group that has two forms, Britsan and Butsan, and one group that has four for forms, Britsan, Butsan, Ritsan, and Tsan. And I call these group B and group A. It may seem counterintuitive that I don't call them group A and group B, uh, but rather group B and group A. That's because, as you will see anon, that uh, I think group A is older and group B is younger. But for the purposes of exposition, I think it's easier to discuss the simpler pattern first and the more complicated pattern second. And that's what I have just uh, explained here. Uh, but we're going to look at, so text group B first, that has two forms, and we'll look at word initial and word internal. So. Looking at word initial, the word initial form is always butsen. That's to say, with the B, but without the R. You get things like tsempo, emperor, tsenmo, empress, and tsentore, which is a, a, a person's name. Now, uh, looking at word internally, the word internal form is usually brutsen, with the B and with the R. So you get things like uh, detsen, which is a title, and moktsen. Uh, which means mighty helmet, and uh, Gelzen, which means mighty victor. So that was it for texts uh, in group B, because it's you know a relatively simple pattern with only two forms. Now we will turn to texts in group A, where we have uh, four cases to consider. And these are word initial, where we get Bzan, same as in group A, B. Word internal after vowels, Bzan, word internal after the consonants nga, ga, ba, and ma, you get rtsan, and word internal after the consonants r, la, n, and s, you get tsan, with no b and no r. Now, I just want to, sort of, the linguist in me can't help but say uh, the, these, these consonants do form natural classes. To use uh, Jacobson's terminology, the first ones are uh, grave, the ga, nga, ba, ma, and the second ones are acute, or la, na, sa. So it, it, it's not a totally random fact that, you know, oh, some letters do it this way and some letters do it this way. They, they, these sounds form natural sort of classes in terms of their articulation uh, in the mouth. Okay, so looking at word initial, you know, this slide will look familiar, but now we're looking at text group B. Uh, tsempo, tsenmo, and tsentore, you get the B uh, prescript, but not the R superscript. And looking at uh, word internal, you get both the B prescript and the R superscript. You've seen these examples bef before, at least some. Uh, Detsen, uh, Tritsen, and Tlatsen, uh, divine emperor. Okay, now we get you know, to, the, to, to, the, to the ways that uh, text group a is different. Uh, so word internal after nga, ga, ba, and ma, we usually have rtsan. So we have things like moktsan, mighty helmet, tongtsan, a name, and gimtsan, who is also a name. And then after the acute uh, finals, so r, uh, la, na, and sa, we usually get uh, tsan, T S A N, uh, in examples like gyaltsan. Kartsan, a mighty castle, and Munsan, uh, which is a name. Okay. And we do have nice cases where two forms of the same word are contrasted in a single text, which, which let me just explain methodologically why I see that as important, is it, it, you can't say, oh, it's just noise. You know, so well, some texts have these forms, some texts have these forms. If you actually get in one single passage both forms following the rule, then it, it means, you know, the language actually b behaved this rule as a, as a systematic thing. So, um, so just let's look at the example. So, tsempo chen tong chen tang, 
Chung Tsen Tsong Ni Nal Nol Ne, the imperial elder brother Tsong Tsen, and the other younger brother Tsen Tsong fought. So, you know, it's nice because the, their names are extremely similar. One's Tsen Tsong, one's Tsong Tsen, but you get the the just you get the rtsan form and the bts btsan form depending on the context that i uh, explained previously and then uh, for the second one we have uh, zhang tritsen dang zhang gyaltsen uncle tritsen and uncle gyaltsen where uncle tritsen gets the b because tree ends in a vowel and uncle gyaltsen doesn't get the b or the r because gyal ends in an l then uh, Lun Gyaltsen Tang, Lun Tsenzong, Minister Gyaltsen and Minister Tsenzong. So uh, Gyaltsen again uh, without the B or the R. And then uh, Tsenzong, because it's word initial, the B but not the R. And, and here, so I've contrasted you know, the, 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 the forms sort of pairwise using textual passages. Okay. So now let's look at exceptions. I've sort of given you, you know, in order to kind of well, sort of experimenting with different presentation styles in part, I've decided this kind of top-down version where I just tell you the answer and then convince you it's true is better than sort of more um, uh, empirically saying, well, let's just see. Have we noticed a pattern? Have we noticed a pattern? That's more time-consuming and, and harder to follow. So I've just given you the pattern, but now let's look at the exceptions. So there are are many exceptions in group A texts. I mean, partly, you know, group A has a more complicated pattern, so you would expect more exceptions, whereas group B has a simpler pattern, so there are fewer exceptions. So, uh, but the, the exceptions predominantly occur in three texts. Those are uh, the Royal Genealogy, the Chronicle, and the prayers for the foundation of Degoyutsal Monastery. One thing that's fun about Old Tibetan studies is we all read about the same six texts over and over and over again. Um, <laughs> so, you know, all, all, all the prayers for the foundation of Degoyutsal Monastery, for instance, came up a lot in, uh, in, 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 in Dr. Ju's uh, talk, um, as did actually, for that matter, the, the Chronicle, but I think less so the genealogy, anyhow. So. Uh, my proposal for explaining the exceptions is that group A texts are earlier and group B texts are later, uh, but the three exceptional group A texts properly belong to group B, which is to say, they, I think those three texts are later texts, but then why have I put them in group A? Well, I put them in group A because they have all four forms. Well, why do they have all four forms if they're group B texts? My, ex uh, my explanation is that they have retained some type A examples as archaisms. Uh, and, and that's, of course, possible, right? Older things can be transmitted to younger things. Younger things can't be transmitted to older things. So, so if I'm right that group B texts are later, you wouldn't necessarily mind seeing a few type A cases in, uh, in, in group B. So that's the proposal I... I'm going to make and I'm going to try and argue for it a little bit. So first of all, uh, well-behaved type A texts are early. Like uh, uh, this is, let's, let's try it on texts of known date, if you like, yeah? So the Zhou inscription from circa 763 is a type A text. And the annals, and kind of when the annals are from, is a very hard question to answer, uh, kind of in a sense, but if anything can, can, can claim to be the oldest text we still have in Tibetan, it's, it's probably the annals. So, um, so uh, well, let's just say it's a type A uh, text as well. Whereas uh, type B texts uh, and poorly behaved type A texts, and here I'm just listing the poorly behaved type A texts, uh, are later, like the Chronicles, uh, and I forget uh, exactly when uh, Brandon and, and Agnieszka said the Chronicle is from, but it's late. Yeah, or, I mean, it's still old Tibetan. We're talking about f pretty small time spans here, but it's, it's late-ish, yeah? And, uh, and the prayers uh, for the foundation of the Yusuf Monastery, we know, are from around 822. So they're late. Okay. And now, just so I think, you know, maybe I've already convinced you uh, that there's this pad, there's this, these two patterns, and there's type A and type B, and type A is older and type B is younger. 
uh, but some type A texts are actually type B texts that just uh, have retained some type A examples. But now let's look at some actual sort of philological evidence. Um, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to discuss a principle of historical linguistics here, which is uh, the fourth law of analogy uh, of uh, Kuruwowicz, uh, which specifies that when a language presents a doublet, the more transparent form is older, uh, and the more sorry no sorry I got that wrong. The more transparent form is younger, and the more opaque form is uh, older, and that both means formally and semantically. So I give you two examples. Lost in English is new, whereas forlorn is old, and you get that both in the the R, which reflects um, this Germanic process called grammatische Wechsel that has been analogically leveled in English. It's still preserved in the alternation is R and was were, where you get the R in the R and the w and the were, right? So you get this S R alternation. So it used to be in English you had something like lose with an S and lorn with an R, and you keep that in forlorn with the specialized meaning and the archaic form. Yeah, and then also melted versus molten, where where you have the the verb melt and uh, the productive, both both formally productive and uh, transparent past tense is melted uh, that also has the the more broad meaning whereas the more specific meaning molten is only really used in metal and chocolate uh, has also you know has the the, the formally I'm sorry for, yeah formally archaic look has this different oblate grade so it has the o rather than the e and a more specific meaning so that's Kurolowitz's law uh, where you know, if you if you two if you see two things that are sort of similar in form and similar in meaning, the one that has the more specific meaning and the more wacky form is the inherited one, and the other one's new. Yeah. So now let's look at uh, a, a case where I'm going to apply this this law in Old Tibetan. So in the prayers for the foundation of the Gyutso Monastery, we have uh, type A Kartsen, which is a place name. And you have type B, Moktsen, which means mighty helmet. So Kartsen should mean uh, uh, mighty castle, but it's a place name. Uh, whereas in the text, Moktsen actually means mighty helmet. So my explanation is the, 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 the one with the clear meaning, the transparent meaning, the type B example, is new. Whereas the one with the specialized, you know, uh, um, not, no longer active, specific meaning is old. Uh, so, so, yeah. So I think that helps, you know, uh, confirm my hypothesis that, that prayers, for instance, is a type B text, but it's kept type A features where you would expect it to keep them as archaisms in things like this, the conventionalized spellings of place names. Ah, <laughs> let's come back to that. In, let's come back to that in the questions. Yeah, <laughs> I've given this t talk several times and no one's spotted that so far. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So now uh, moving along. Uh, now we have a linguistic criterion to separate Old Tibetan documents and Late Tibetan documents. So, so you know, first I say, well, what's this? What's this? We have this mess. We're trying to figure out the the pattern. Of, of the spelling alternation. Oh, look, it's, it's, it correlates with old texts and new texts. Well, now we can actually, for texts of unknown date, we can use this criterion to assign them either to the earlier or the later period. So let's do that. And I actually have to, to uh, give Brandon full credit for making the talk interesting by suggesting this case study. So, um, so here it goes. The Pari Bell, which was first published in ten, uh, sorry, in, <laughs> in the first published in two thousand eleven. Uh, so it's a bell from Pari, uh, and it mentions Emperor Treated Tsuksen, who lived from seven o four to seven fifty five. And the fellow who published this article thinks that the bell is from uh, the life of this emperor, so thus is older than the Zhou inscription, which would make this bell the oldest you know, a dateable extant Tibetan text.
older than the Zhou inscription. If if we uh, if we uh, believe, I think his name is Lachok, the guy who published this article. But let's look at uh, its uh, spelling. So uh, the act, the emperor's name Tsuktsen, uh, is type B. So so it's not that old. Yeah, uh, is is my uh, suggestion. If the bell is in fact older than uh, the Zhou inscription, it should have been Tsuk Tsen without the B. Tsuk Rtsen. Yeah. Now, I, I, I just want to make clear that I'm, I'm not saying that the bell was made yesterday or that it's fake or that it's, you know, that, that it's not even pretty early Old Tibetan. I'm just saying it at least belongs to type B Old Tibetan texts, which means that it's not older than the Zhou inscription and it is from after the time of the emperor who's mentioned in it. Okay, now, so there's this lovely pattern in Old Tibetan texts. Is there any sign of it in classical Tibetan? And the answer is a little bit. So as, particularly if we look at the behavior of, of numerals, you'll notice that um, the word for 10 in the, the decades, so in words like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, the word for 10 keeps its B prescript when the preceding syllable ends in a vowel, but it loses the B prescript when the preceding syllable ends in a consonant. So it behave, so, so the, the, let's call it the prescript deletion rule that you saw as active in the words like pun, and, uh, which was um, official, and tsun queen in Old Tibetan, is still that that pattern is still followed by the word ten in these uh, numerals in classical Tibetan. Uh, and now I'll just look at a few nouns in, in classical Tibetan where I think that um, these patterns uh, elucidate at least the etymology or the spelling of classical Tibetan words. So if we look at sonam, which means punya, it means merit, yeah, it's also a common man's name. It's uh, just, we know because of uh, the Mahadvyupati uh, that it is a compound of uh, su, which means to foster, and nam, which means to gain. But hitherto, uh, we would just say, well, why when they made this compound did they delete the BS? Yeah, well, it's perfectly regular. Like in Old Tibetan, when you make a compound, uh, the second element, you know, if the, if the second element begins with a, uh, a prescript and a superscript and follows a element that ends in a D, you should delete the prescript and the superscript. That, we saw that pattern already, which is to say writing sonam and deleting the BS from the second uh, morpheme is good behavior for, for compound internal sundi in Old Tibetan. Now, you know, the, the word you've all been waiting for, tsuklak, which, um, which Dr. Drew talked about. Um, uh, so, we, well, whatever it means, according to the, according to the Mahadvyupati, it means uh, arsha or vihara or shastra. As far as its etymology, there's been lots of ink spilled on this question. Uh, but uh, let's go with the most recent contribution, uh, which is that of Michal Han in 2003. And he said... It's uh, from uh, it's a it's a compound of the two verb stems, future verb stems, uh, penetrate gutsuk and read black, uh, and uh, then he just sort of, um, I mean, in, in 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 I think a quite convincing way, he he draws parallels. He says, well, and here are some other examples where a future stem deletes the b in the second element of a compound, but here we can say it's not just that, you know, oh, some compounds delete uh, the B in the second element of, uh, you know, in a future stem. That's a rule. Like, it's, it's a phonotactic rule that we saw operational in Old Tibetan. So, so I think, let's say, mm, this is a reason to maybe think uh, maybe his etymology is right, or maybe, maybe in any case, my uh, explanation of how prescript and superscript deletion works in Old Tibetan compounds is consistent with Han's uh, etymology. And there's an, a mean question lurking uh, in this word too. We'll see whether Brandon figures it out for the uh, <laughs> question and answers session. Um, 
Okay, and then last but not least, uh, Tenchu, which means uh, Shastra. It's the same Ten as in Tenjur, right? But ten, ten, Tenjur is something like Tenchu Bei Yurwa or something. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it, it looks like it violates the pattern because you say, oh, ten chu, there shouldn't be a B there. Uh, but in old Tibetan texts, or even in some classical Tibetan texts, ten chu is a frequent, frequently met with spelling. So actually, just already, I think, from a, kind of the, the principle of lectio difficilior in text editing, you would say the one without the B prescript is probably older, but here I can sh have also demonstrated that the one without the B prescript is, you know, correct if you're interested in following the rules that I've been articulating. And what I think is exciting is the bun, you know, the bumpos, they don't like the word ch. So wherever, they, so wherever they find the word ch, they change it into bun. And they changed it into bun in this word, which means when a bumpo, you know, whoever did it the first time, saw the word ten ch, he was thinking without the b prefix because because then it looks like uh, the word ch that means dharma, uh, and it should be changed into bun. Now, when I gave this talk previously, someone objected. They said, "But the the ch in ten ch has nothing to do with the ch that means dharma," and I completely agree with that as a sort of a Buddhologist or a linguist or whatnot. My point is just. S at least one bumpo once <laughs> saw ten chu and thought he saw the word dharma there because otherwise it wouldn't have been changed into bun in bun terminology, right? So, so that's an uh, uh, let's say these two pieces of evidence: the fact that you actually get orthographic variation on it, and the fact that you know bumpos somehow see the correct form as without the b prefix indicates to me that, yeah, in Old Tibetan, uh, it, it probably shouldn't have had the B, B prefix, uh, and, and the, the spelling with the B is a kind of morpho, uh, what's it called, a, a, a morphophonemic spelling, if you like, to reveal its etymology. Yeah. Anyhow, those are uh, the, that's the end of my presentation. And uh, just sort of in passing, I'll point out that um, because prescripts and superscripts behave differently in terms of their phonotactics inside of uh, consonant, uh, or sorry, inside of compounds, it makes sense to write them different places in the syllable, right? You can say, if, if you want to answer the question, why did Tumi Sambota, if such a man uh, existed, which he didn't, why did he decide to write some things to the left and some things on top? It's because he had noticed this quite complicated pattern of... Um, of compound internal sundi, and thought, well, why don't I index it somehow in my spelling system? Which is to say, I think that uh, the Tibetan, far from being some sort of arbitrary, arcane frippery of the, you know, of the nefarious lamas, uh, this, this, this idiosyncrasy of the Tibetan spelling system actually shows that it, it's a, it's a very well designed orthographic system that. That, that, that encodes a lot of linguistic information. Yeah, so that's the end of my talk. Okay, Shungong. Okay, so oh, let me say and make sure the cameras are rolling. Uh, I'm very indebted to, to, to my collaboration with Abel Zadox on this paper. In fact, the, the, the initial insights uh, to look at Sen and Pun in their distribution in compounds, that was his suggestion. I did the kind of philological legwork, but uh, but I want to say, you know, the 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 to the extent that you see a good idea here, it's his good idea.